Hey, everybody, and welcome back to the Power Women in Insurance podcast. My name is Teresa Kitchens, your host, and I am excited today because I have Trio Gordon with me. She hails from Benton, Arkansas, so she's not far from Dallas, where I'm at, and I know that she works directly with uh, Premier Insurance Advisors out of Little Rock, and so I'm excited because she's right in my backyard coming out of Dallas, and I've been through the whole Arkansas area so many times with family in Memphis, and I just feel like we have this little kindred spirit, so I am excited. So Trio, thank you for joining us and welcome. Welcome to the podcast today. Thank you for having me. Well, I am excited because the way that we connected was I know that on one of the Facebook groups that we're on, uh, somebody posted out there, hey, you know, anybody know any really strong, amazing women speakers that have a really good message and a really good, um, a really good presence. And so your name popped up multiple times. So then at that point, I was like, oh, my goodness, I have to reach out to this person. and I have to get to know her. So I am pumped because I am excited because we did talk a little bit. Your journey, your insurance uh, uh, journey has been amazing. So why don't we start off with you telling us a little bit about who you are and how you got into insurance? So I got into insurance on complete accident. Um, I was offered a job uh, with a life insurance company. I don't even remember the name of it anymore. (laughs) Years ago. And. I got the licensure and then I realized whatever it was I was partaking in was very scammy Um, in home house visits, places that I didn't even feel safe or comfortable. And I said, okay, that's it for me. Um, Insurance must be a scam. Right. This is is crazy. And I think I was 20 maybe at the time. I was a young mom as well. And two about two weeks before that licensure would have expired completely, I got an interview at a state farm office. Okay. And I actually, I got hired to be a receptionist and kind of learned that I was pretty good at pivoting uh, to, to make sales. Cause I was, I was very money hungry being, being young yeah. and, and a mom and poor. Um, and because I wasn't a producer that, that, my opportunity to do that was limited unless I figured out how to do it on the service side. Yeah. So that's, and here I am uh, roughly 10 years later, you know, after getting my very first office setting job. And now I am the owner of an agency. So <laughs> it's like I said, I'm still, I'm still shocked. I'm here. Right. Right. Well, I think, you you know, you didn't enter this industry, right, to be here forever, more or less to enter into ownership and be able to kind of do a lot of that. And I think sometimes that really throws us off whenever we, uh, these these amazing opportunities come to us. And it's like, okay, well, am I going to stay here? What do I want? What am I doing? How did you decide coming from maybe that less than ideal situation? And I think sometimes we do all kind of enter that industry from a back door, right? Maybe we get hired on because we're looking for something for a little bit of part-time work or we're in school or, you know, like you mentioned, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, maybe, you know, a, 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 an easy entry point for some things, you know, how do you do transition and um, what was that journey like for you to decide to really stay in the industry and to really make it your professional home? Because I think that's a mental mind shift rather than, Hey, I need a job to, Hey, this is my career. Right. I mean, I just think it's a big, it's a big mental mind shift. I looked at it, I think, as just a job for for a long time. Um, you know, I this is what I do from nine to five at five. It's done. I go home, I get paid. Um, that's the end of it. But, you know, working in, in that office in particular, I, I was able to make some really good, long lasting friendships and see what a good working environment look like with with yeah. your coworkers. Um but then I was approached by a district manager with another captive carrier who wanted to initially wanted me to be a producer for his son's agency. Oh. So, so I, I I did the interview for this and at the end of it, he he called me back and he said point blank my son can't afford you. Mm. Why don't, why don't we open an agency for you? So 
I had secured the loan. I had um, was about to sign an office lease. And thank God I didn't because the shutdown happened uh, one month later. Um, so, so glad I didn't sign that. Wow. Lease. Yes. Would have been on the hook for thousands of dollars for a space I couldn't even utilize. Yeah. And I think that was a blessing in disguise because the closer I got to actually signing that contract, there were just red flags everywhere. Um, yeah. You know, how, how, how many policies are on the book that I'm buying? And never could get a straight answer. Really? How, how much premium is, is on the books that I'm buying? Never could get a straight answer. And obviously, we know that's very important information to yeah. know. Um, it, just because you and I both know when an agency transitions to a new agency, a lot of that premium is going to fall off. Yeah. They're, you know, they're going to leave the agency. So not even knowing how much cushion room was going to be in there. I was like, this is a bad deal. I'm not, I'm not taking it. Yeah. And went back to work for a captive again for, for a couple of years. And I think that's where my mindset changed was doing all of the work, literally doing all of the work. And that's, you know, I get it. You become an agency owner so that you can have your own free time. But at some point it's, I'm making somebody else a lot of money and that, some, yep. and that somebody else is not me. And, <laughs> right. You know, it's like, I don't, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to, I want to make the money. I want to have the control of my time. Yep. I don't, I don't want to have to ask someone else's permission if I can go pick up my sick kid from school. Yep. Well, I think COVID really changed a lot of that. And I think it really brought to the forefront, number one, a little bit more of a flexible schedule for those agencies and, and uh, you know, um, whatever groups that are willing to be able to embrace it. But I think I think we all kind of sat back after that that timeline and just said, hey, there's there's more to life here than that. We don't have to be, you know, in a in an office and or we could we could offer some flexibility. And I think those agencies that have not done that or embraced that, I think they've lost a lot of their uh, their really, really good, strong, uh, you know, backbone team members. Yes. And I think, you know, the line for me was I did have a sick child that needed to be picked up from school. And I was told, no, really, I was told you need to figure something else out. Uh -uh. And, you know, at, at this point, my youngest was two, okay. two, and I'm like, okay, no, I had already cleaned out my desk, by the way, because I hated this job that much. Like, you know, <laughs> like I just, I would have noticed, <laughs> right? Yeah. And so I, just, I grabbed my things and I said, I'm going to go now and I'm not coming back. And that was it. And I took an independent position with a, a with an agency um, like the next couple of weeks. So, okay. and I've been, and I've been in the independent space since then. And yeah, and my, my youngest is now seven, if that gives you any gauge, you know, of how long ago I moved over, but yep. Yep. So, so as you were making that transition, so now we've, we've kind of talked about the mental transition, but then the transition from captive to, to independent is really a very interesting one because all of a sudden you've got so many different carriers, so many different appetites. You have so many different ways that the, the territories need to be run based on how the carriers want. How was that transition for you? And what did you find really benefited you in that? Because I think a lot of people get, um, scared and are they're super excited and a lot of people think that because they get markets uh plural with an s all of a sudden all their problems are going to go away and they think all of a sudden they're going to be making millions of dollars because they've got so many markets that they can help everybody right i mean i think that's one of the the big myths i've heard if as, as i say you know coming out of that captive side so I had to learn a lot when it came to commercial, because as you know, captives, their, their, their ball field is very small. Right. Um, and also their applications are with what they will accept. They're almost foolproof. You know, it's a click, 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 click process. It's, it's hard to mess it up. Um, 
learning the accord forms, mm -hmm. learning that portion. Thank God I had the most patient underwriter on the planet. <laughs> I, he was with he was with RPS at the time. Her name is uh, Vicky, and she was. I wouldn't have made it without yeah. her. Like, Shout like out Vicky. <laughs> yes, I know. I know people like to give underwriters a hard time, but if you can actually make a good relationship with one, invaluable, invaluable, yeah. and they will prioritize your stuff and your accounts. Nice. Um, yeah. But the markets. Um, I see a lot of people gain access to the markets, especially coming from captive, but then they start writing business. They have no business writing yep. because they don't. And we've all done it because we have to learn. Yep. I mean, we've all taken at least one account on in the beginning that we shouldn't have. We should have referred it off, but, but that is also, you know, on the, on the flip side of that, that is how you learn. And mm -hmm. So it's, I've also seen, like you mentioned, everybody gets the access to the markets and they're like, yes, now I can sell everything. Yeah. Um, I'm going to close every deal. This is going to be an income, you know, deal breaker. But I see a lot of those people are so bad at managing their own time. Mm. Like, you know, and some people just don't do well unless they have somebody right there to tell them. This is when you start work. This is when you go to lunch. This is when you go home. Um, kind of so like not. the work from home thing, right? Is that a lot of people, for some people, it just doesn't work. For some people, it is fabulous, amazing, and a game changer. And for some people, it is the death nail to their career. I mean, some people uh -huh. just need the extra structure. They need the, a desk separate away from their family or their home or their whatever, and some people, you know, they can balance it all and they can manage it all and they actually are more focused that way. I think, you know, some people, I think the cult, the captive culture is wonderful and, and they have a lot of training and they have a lot of background um, knowledge and mentorship and all that. But when you get out there independent, there is very little of that. Yes. And, you know, when I did it, I was just given logins, logins and passwords and they were like, go. Really? And I'm like, go, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. Like, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't know. Oh, where? where are we going? <laughs> yeah. I have never used any of these systems before. Wow. So it just took a lot of attention to, to detail. Um, yeah. To, to learn. Um, I still struggle with some carrier websites, but those are the ones that, you know, you have your favorites and you have the ones that aren't your favorites and you just do whatever you can possibly do to try not to use the ones that you don't like. Yeah. Um, True. And, so I know that that's another thing. You can have all the markets in the world. You're not going to ever use them all. Yeah. Just, you're not. You're not. You're, you get your go-tos. And once you kind of have those established, unless you have a, a weird, weird risk, typically you're just going to keep going back to those same comfortable, comfortable markets that typically fit your needs. Yeah. Um, yeah. I found that most agencies have between three to five, depending on their markets and kind of what their specialty is. Even in commercial, you have probably three underwriters that you just love and they kind of have their a little bit more specialty markets a little bit. Like, you know, this one over here maybe does a little bit more in this arena or this one likes maybe the harder to place. This one's more this I'm not not maybe standard, not standard, you know. But um, I find that that really what you nut down to is three to five. And I know that's still more than one, but I know that sometimes that one has like um, a different breadth of, of what they're willing to take. Like they take a pretty wide spectrum. I know some ca yeah. some captives will take a pretty wide spectrum, even though they don't have a lot of options to shop things with, but they still take a lot of, a lot of uh, people, a lot of different uh, roles of life or a lot of different businesses or whatever. But I know mm -hmm. that when we get out there, I think comfortably, and tell me if you disagree, but I think three to five is usually what most people really concentrate on. It really is. It, it really is. And like I said, unless you just get a weird out of the box right. risk that, you know, that's when you're hitting up all the other available ones, trying to see if it's something that they can take. Yeah. And, you know, uh, and more often than not, they can't take it either. Uh, <laughs> you know, so that's, that's been my personal experience, but 
one thing I do strongly want to talk about, I will tell you this, going from captive, like I said, the nine to five thing, I did have this really nice semblance of maintaining my home. Okay. Um, you know, clean, clean house, clean laundry, um, for all intents and purposes, you know, a lot of the time my, my last home looked like nobody lived in it. Cause I just, <laughs> I just kept it so nice and clean. Right. Um, turn it on the robot vacuum every chance I got, you know, like yep. this is, and when I went independent and started working from home, that's, that's when the dumpster fire happened. Yeah, um, hard. and I, I do, I see a lot of women that are just like, Oh, I'm, I'm a boss babe and showing pictures of their, you know, mint condition, clean houses. And, <laughs> You know, making the rest of us feel like we're we're inadequate. But I think a lot of what those women are not saying is that they pay a maid service. Yeah. They pay someone to do the laundry. And that's okay. But say that. Just yeah. say it. Because the rest of us are out here knee deep in laundry. And, yeah. you know, our kitchen is dirty. And it's, you know, especially those of us that work from home. And it's so hard to, it's hard to look at it when you're busy yeah. working. It well, I think like working from home too, like, I don't want to, I don't want to go through the mail. I mean, it's stupid mm -hmm. stuff like that. Like, and the mail just kind of piles up because I'm like, I already had to do junk with, I've been on email all day long. I've been doing like, I don't want to. And then it just like, finally, every once in a while, I just divide it in half. And I tell my husband, you have to go through this half. I'll go through this half. We just got to get rid of some of this stuff. And most mm -hmm. of it's just spam stuff. It's not a big deal, but it just, I don't want to throw it away because I don't know what it is, but yet it clutters. And it's just, there's for me, mail is a really big thing. Laundry is a big thing, but my kids are grown. So it's not as big, but for me, it's mail. It's like the never ending pile of mail, you know, and I just tend to put it on my island in the middle of the kitchen and this little like side thing and it just piles up until I'm exhausted. with it. Yeah. I mean, I think everybody has one of those, the, yeah. just the, the pile on the kitchen counter yeah. where things go to die yeah. and then we get it off like once a month. And <laughs> so it's, it's truly though, it's a big, it's a big mental struggle in feeling like I'm not doing a good enough job even though even though the business is growing you know my book of business is growing and but the house it seems like it's just it's always a disaster and right. and well you know when I legitimately say I don't have time to do it right I don't I don't not unless I want to stay up you know until like midnight when everyone is in bed doing it. and occasionally that is what I resort to I yeah. end up staying up all night to clean my house and it is an exhausting cycle. Yeah. Like it's an exhausting cycle. It also makes you realize that like, we just, we have too much stuff. Yeah. Stuff, you know, just it's very true. I've, I've done a massive clean out in all of my children's rooms here recently. And I mean, just, you know, but was able to declutter bags and bags and bags of yeah. stuff that no longer in my house. And that makes me feel a lot better. Yeah. But. Well, you know, and I think we need to do that in business sometimes too. So we need to sometimes like clean out like our desks and our office space. And even if we work from home or not, sometimes I just put things off to the side. I don't really deal with them. Um, you know, sometimes you put things off like running a business that, you know, you can do tomorrow if you, if you have to take care of a client today, but simultaneously that ends up everything kind of ends up piling up at one point, right? And everything ends up to where you got to be able to dedicate to it. And how have you made the transition from being in sales and growing your book and working from home and having kids and all of these things? And I know that they haven't transitioned, of course, out of, out of those, but with that lifestyle into the conversation of ownership, because that's, again, another mental shift to be able to make sure, and I know that with that, that um, one of the things we've talked about is that every day one of your hot top priorities is just true authenticity. And I love that you are very, very honest and real about that because I think as people go through this journey uh, from say, you know, receptionist to sales to, to, to then to ownership or management, I think sometimes we think we have to live up to a certain level of something. And then all of a sudden we realize we're playing a game that we don't need to be playing and it causes more stress. Mm -hmm. And I have seen, you know, even right down to, um, you know, people also think they need to look a certain way, not just yeah. act a certain way, but they think they need to look a certain way. I've, I've met women who wear fake glasses. 
Oh, how funny. Because they think it makes them look like intelligent or serious or something. And I'm like, that, I'm like, that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard, you yeah. guys. Like, if they serve no purpose, like, what, what are you doing? What, you're making everyone think you can't see. Like, <laughs> and I'm like just, what, what are we doing here? Um, you know, to, to each their own, but it's not, it's not for, it's not for me. And I can't, I can't keep up any sort of facade of being one person here and one person there. Cause I'm yeah. going to mess up at some point. And those are going to come out when they're not supposed yeah. to. It's much easier to just be me all the time. Yeah. And, and if you don't like it, fine, just stay away. Um, you know, like that's, I'm fine with that. Like I can, I can live with that. Um, cause I don't like, and we all know these people that are just completely disingenuine. They are not, um, you know, and it's typically those people that are like, oh my gosh, and bless your heart. No, you know, <laughs> and it, it just, it gives me the ick. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it, but it's, you, you know, right off the bat, not to trust those people. And I think when people are not genuine to themselves, then they're never going to be genuine to you. And I cannot play, like I said, play that game because to me, if I cannot be honest with myself about who I am and bring myself to the table every day, and if they can't do the same thing for themselves, then they're, I mean, if we, if we shortchange ourselves and who we are, then why would we not shortchange other people and what we bring to the table every day for them? And I just, mm -hmm. for me, that is a, um, deal breaker in a lot of ways. Like I can, I can handle some social stuff. I mean, don't get me wrong. Everybody's got image stuff, but at the same point, like my true deep connections with people are not people that are super image or, or um, you know, trying to live up to whatever it is they have in their head that they want to try to make sure that they put off in the world. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. And I don't care, you know, one bit about the whole keeping up with the, the Joneses theory, you know, yeah. like I just, again, like that's not, that's not who I am. So there's no point in it. But like we said earlier, you know, I think a lot of people aren't honest about that keeping up with the Joneses concept, right? Like you were talking about with the laundry, right? Like this, these people, they go, oh my gosh, they put, they post these perfect pictures of their house, blah, blah, blah. But then on the other side of it, they don't tell you that maybe they just cleaned for the first time in three years. I don't know. You know, right. maybe they have a housekeeper, you know, maybe they... Mm -hmm. You know, maybe they maybe they just moved in or bought a brand new house. Of course, that's going to look totally different from the house I've been in for 15 years. You know, right. um, you know, maybe, you know, I know I know people that actually have gone to other people's houses to be able to do videos for social media and different things like that, like rented out spaces, Airbnbs. And they take these pictures in like these beautiful lofts or beautiful loft spaces or apartments or homes or Mm -hmm. whatever and they're not even that like they like they pay for it and then they leave and they can't go back I'm like that's not authentic that's not really no. who you guys are you know <laughs> and I and I don't I don't just really can't do that I see that happen a lot uh, the goofily enough and um in the animal space of like Instagram and things like that so obviously I, I rehab raccoons so I follow lots of accounts with raccoons uh -huh. and but these people will be like you're saying in these immaculate, beautiful homes and trying to convince you that a raccoon lives there. <laughs> and, and I'm sorry, but they're lying. And that right. is not like they're no, that's not what the inside of your house looks like when there is one of those animals in it. It's just not. <laughs> um, so I see it and I see people do it. But like you said, I, I steer clear of those people mm -hmm. um even I debated on using a space in my friend's house to do this and at the end of the day I was like no what's wrong with my kitchen like I'll yep. just sit in my, you know I'll sit in my dining room um it may not be as up to date as hers but this you know this is mine this is mine this is you but it's you and I think yeah. your clients probably see that too I mean um mm -hmm. you know they don't they don't worry they know that when they work with you they know what they're getting Yes. And Absolutely. I know that's really good for retention. That's really good for long-term relationships. And, you know, this business is, I mean, everybody goes, oh, it's a relationship business. And it is a relationship business, but it also is a value business that mm -hmm. we have to make sure we bring our best and we, we bring what the clients need and we take care of them. People are not, just because they're 
you know, my brother's uncle's cousin's aunt, whatever, they're not going to pay 10,000 times more than they're going to pay somewhere else. I mean, there's a line for that. But at the same point, we still have to bring ourselves every day, but we still have to do our very best every day. And I think one really important thing is that we can't compare somebody's beginning of their story to somebody else's maybe end of their story, right? Like I can't compare myself as an agency owner to somebody who's been in the industry or who came from a different background or who came from maybe maybe they were running a, a, a state farm agency, right? Or a farmer's agency or whatever. And they had all this training behind them and they knew all that. Well, then I came in fresh, cold turkey. You know, I had no idea. So my, my beginning, middle and end are going to look very, very different from their beginning, middle and end. Just because they come from a different space, a different background, a different training, um, you know, our agencies may be run differently. We may make notes in our system differently, all of those things. But as long as we do it authentically as who we are, and as long as we cover the bases, right, there's always, you know, issues, there's always things that you need to make sure that you do. I think people see that authenticity. And I think we, people shop insurance based on the culture of our agency and our agents as much as they do the, the finances. Yes, they do. I mean, they do. Absolutely. You're always going to have you're always going to have those people that no matter how hard you try, will leave over five bucks. Yeah. Um, and there is zero sense in attempting to keep them. Yep. There, there's also zero sense when they come back and want another quote. They're not your people. Let it go. Yeah. <laughs> Let it go. Don't waste your time. Let them internet shop because that's what they're going to do at every single renewal. Just don't, don't waste your time on it. Right. Um, I have, it's your, typically though I do, I, I run into it's, and I know every agent does this, but it, it's sometimes your, your customer who, who do have the comfy financing will scream the loudest when, when anything changes, you know, yeah. when it comes, when it comes to premiums and stuff. And, but a lot of that is just, you have to be able to you have to be able to explain. You have to be able to explain this, this happened, which caused this to happen. And now we're here. Yep. Um, and as long as you can make it make sense, most people, they get it. Like they, yeah. they still want to act mad, but they get it. Right. Um, it's the mayonnaise is $10 guy, you know, mayonnaise is 10 bucks. Like we, what did you think was going to happen with your car insurance? Right. Um, so, well, and I think too, a lot of them will go on out, maybe they shop it or whatever, and they realize that what you're telling is the truth, right? It's not like, you know, you've got a $500 increase on, on your homeowner's insurance or something like that, where they, but they go up, up after that, they're still going to have $500 home, you know, increase or more probably. And, yeah. if, and if they can't find anything cheaper, it's maybe a hundred dollars cheaper. It's not the $500, maybe it's 400, but it's definitely not like $50 increase like they used to have. Right. And I think, yeah. I think our culture has to change in that space too. And I think we're seeing that. I think the, now that we're on what three, year three of these really intense um, increases, at least in Texas, I think that everybody's kind of settling down a little bit about the 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 ticked offedness, even though now you know inflation's matching in general. Like you said, the mayonnaise and the eggs and everything else is kind of going up as well. But um, I think people are getting less shocked when it comes in. But yeah, at the same point, they're they're like, when will this end? You know, but. If you have that relationship and they know you're honest and if you if you can explain it to them, I think generally we're seeing a good response from clients. Yes. And I mean, it doesn't ever hurt, you know, to I remind these people so it's fresh on their brain that, hey, I, I, I'm I living in the same economy you are. Yep. You know, I I'm having to pay for all the same things that you're having pay for whether it be groceries and milk or gas or utilities you know because they have all increased substantially and I have to pay it too yep. so it's important to remind them about that because sometimes I think your average person just thinks we're all loaded yeah uh, that's you true. know and, yeah and that's certainly not the case when we're starting out um so like me right now uh, <laughs> right yeah like you want to talk about poor, honey, I am poor. Um, <laughs> I can't pay my insurance either when they call me complaints. Yep. Yep. <laughs> you have to, you have to level with people. 
Um, you have to level with them. Get on their level if they if they're mad about the price of gas. I mean, let let them know. Let them know that you also think it sucks. Mm. Um, people like to be listened to. They like to feel like you can relate to them, and that's the that's the biggest yeah. thing. That's true. Biggest. That's true. That's true. Well, I think in this market, I've loved your journey. I love how you have really like come through a lot of things. If you had one piece of advice, I'm totally throwing this on this. So I, I apologize. I'm throwing this on you. I didn't even, I didn't even tell you we were going to do this. I'm just really thinking about it right now. Seeing where you're going, if you were to look back at that receptionist that came on in or that life insurance uh, person who was saying, I don't know if I want to be in this industry. What am I doing? Why am I here? What advice would you give to yourself back then as you kind of know a little bit more about where you are now and working with the agency that you have now? I think what I would tell myself back then would be, hey, listen, you're you're not going to fit in the box of the industry mm -hmm. standard. You're you're not going to make very many connections at networking events. Um you aren't going to be the smartest person in the room about insurance ever. You're never going to be the smartest and you're never going to be the most professional. That personality though is going to take you somewhere. I and it. that, and I would, I, I would tell myself that because I still struggle big with, um, you know, it's not a personal struggle for me, but when I was younger, it was mm -hmm. uh, trying to fit in. Yep. Trying to, trying to dress like my peers in the office did. Um, and I was just never comfortable and it just wasn't. And the more I, you know, the more I fell out of that and into just being me, uh, the easier everything got. So. Yeah. I love that. I love that. That once you let all the other images stuff kind of fall away, that you were really successful at being able to be you and um, be who you wanted to be. And I think there's a, um, I'm reading a really good book right now. Um, oh, it's uh, Joe Dispenza. Let me see. I'm actually going to open it up real quick. So it's 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 about uh, do do do. It's kind of a little bit of a longer name. Oh, the breaking the habit of being yourself. And what it talks about is letting go of what we think is ourself and that image that we think we're supposed to live up to or we're supposed to we're supposed to portray. So breaking the habit of being yourself means creating new habits of living authentically and being that authentic person, but realizing and listening to yourself and your heart and your brain when you're doing those things that are inauthentic, because we have to be really aware of when those things are so that when they come up, we can break the pattern and choose to be able to do the things that are our authentic self. And I'm only halfway through the book, so I'm not going to go any further into it, but it's a great book for people that are looking to be able to, to do that. Because I think that's one thing I think women really struggle with that image and authenticity conversation more than men. But at the same point, I think when we um, get a hold of it, we're much more totally devoted to that authenticity than, I mean, for, for and I mean, you know, because it, it's not a war, right? At the same point, it's a, it's something that we just have to do for ourselves. It's not a, battle cry i think for some people they try to make it a battle cry i am uniquely me and it's almost like you know uh you know from you know some movie for gladiators or something and that's not what it needs to be it could be you just showing up every single day authentically you we don't need to walk around with banners and signs and a full court band telling everybody how authentic we are right i think it's just showing up every day just the same consistent person that we've been in historically or we're going towards because we're not always going to be consistent with our concept of not being image driven. I mean, I, that's just natural, I think, in some ways. But I think if we just try to gravitate towards that authenticity every day, we become more and more and more attached to that authenticity. And I think it really shows through in what we do. I also think, you know, there are so many people out there that do this is they base their self-worth on what they think other people think about yes. them. And what the other person thinks about you is none of your business. That's yep. their business. Um, and 
who cares? Yeah. Who cares? If you're, if you're basing how you feel about yourself on the opinions of others, you are always going to feel down and, or, or you're constantly putting on, like I said earlier, a facade so that you look and act and behave like them. And, and, you know, and whether that be carrying a giant Stanley cup everywhere you go, just so you fit (laughs) in and it, it's silly. It's right. Silly. Right. Exactly. Exactly. What's real? If people want to be able to reach out to you, if they want to connect with you, talk to you about some of these things, maybe have you, uh, you know, just to, just to pick your brain about things, how can they reach out to you so that they can connect? They can find me on Facebook. Um, and my last name is Gordon G O R D E N. Um, and then my email is Triel at Premier I N S A R dot com. Um, but that's how I would prefer for people to to reach out should they want to chat. I love it. I love it. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. I really, really appreciate it. I know you're know you're busy and it's the middle of the week. It's actually Thursday. We're kind of coming down to the end of the week, but at the same point, it's it's always nice to be able to take that time away. So thank you so much. I really appreciate you. Thank you for having me. Well, everybody, this has been another amazing episode of the Power of Women in Insurance podcast. If you go check us out on YouTube, I do have my little Ava with me today. She was starting to bark a little bit and I didn't, I was like, I didn't want to play the, the game. I actually been gone most of the morning and she's a little lonely. So everybody can go online and see little Ava. But, um, I did, you know, people check it out. I got a dog over here. So anyway, but thank you guys so much for watching and for listening today. We are on Apple Pod- Podcasts. We're on uh, Google Podcasts. We're on Apple what iTunes. We're on Spotify. Anywhere that you stream your favorite uh, uh, podcasts. We do have a new episode every single Wednesday. So make sure you check us out. Learn from other women. Reach out to them. Create the community that you want inside this industry because that will be the key to keeping you long-term, sustainable, rocking and rolling and ready in this industry is that community. So we thank you so much for listening and thanks for joining us.